and I'm still doing the oh okay I'm still doing the related uh, study during my postdoc period uh, and that's a short uh, introduction of myself. Uh, this is my 11th year in the China Agriculture University with four years undergraduate, five years PhD and two years postdoc. And I was also a joint PhD student uh, in London in 2019 uh, with the curator Meek and Professor Alfred as my supervisors to help me on the taxonomic and the molecular studies. And now I'm in Melbourne and we'll wow. stay here for uh, several weeks to co cooperate with Dr. Mali on some Australian species. So my talk today will uh, include the following four parts. First is- Want the... to share your screen, sorry. I think you're sorry? not sharing your screen. Can you share your screen, please? Oh, sorry. I wasn't quite sure at what point you were preparing on showing your-, <laughs> showing okay. your... Sorry about that. So is that okay? Perfect. All right. Uh, okay. So um, my talk today, including the four parts, first is the introduction of uh, my research taxa, the taxonomy and diversity of Puritani, and the second part is uh, the most important materials for us, the type specimens about the database and catalog. And the third part is about uh, obtaining DNA from dry specimens and the use of the molecular data. And at last, I would like to show you a study of three uh, closely related species uh, distributing in China. So uh, this subfamily belongs to uh, Heteroptera rigidity, which also called assessing bugs. Uh, currently, there are more than 310 species in 35 January of the world. Um, species of this subfamily are terrestrial, nocturnal, and phototaxic species. So they usually hide in rock crevices, decomposing tree trunk, and other cryptic microhabitats during the daytime. And they will become more active at night. So we usually turn over the rocks or plants during the daytime and uh, using the light trap at night to collect the specimens. Um, these are the diagnostic morphological characters of the, this subfamily. And I would like to focus on this one that the male genitalia of the subfamily uh, is are asymmetric. Uh, this is a quite a unique correct, character even among the whole family, but um, the asymmetric male genitalia could sometimes make the taxonomic study not very easy because you have to be very careful to dissect it. And sometimes taking photos for the genitalia is also challenging because um, even change a very small angle, some structures will look totally different. And those are the bugs we reared in the lab. Uh, we could see the eggs, uh, the nymph, and how they prey. We usually feed them mealworms or some other small insects. On this subfamily also has a very special mating position, uh, the end-to-end position. And in some species, the male and female could even form a straight line, just like some other heteropteran families. And also as a bug, they have the scent uh, gland systems. And when they are in danger, they could release a really bad smell. And also some species could make a hissing noise using the rostrum and the strelitrum on the pro prostenum. Uh, also, uh, species of Pratini also has a very famous that uh, they are extremely painful bite. So uh, even some people's skin may be allergic to their saliva. Um, this subfamily is the sixth largest subfamily within Rejuvity and uh, there are uh, 35 general with more than 310 species. So we could also see that uh, from the illustrations, they are quite um, morphological diversity as well. Species uh, in this subfamily mainly occur in the um, tropical area. So they are most species rich in the Afrotropical region and also the Neotropical region. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very lucky that I could uh, spend a year in, in the Natural History Museum in London to examine the specimens, especially the type specimens, because we all know that the type specimens and original data uh, are the most important things for taxonomic study. And during that time, I also visited several other European museums in France, uh, Belgium, and Sweden. So here, I would like to express my gratitude to all the curators. 
Uh, here is a very interesting case uh, um, to show the importance of type specimen. Uh, this is my paper published last year. It's quite simple, only about one species, uh, the Actomachori stimulus. And this is the images of the type specimen. And this species was described by Distant in 1919. And um, in the same paper, just on the same page, just uh, mm, following stimulus, he described another new species called Melanopterus. Uh, but uh, those two species both distribute in South India and even overlapped here in the, this place called Chika Um, But according to distance original description, Melanopterus has some uh, ochreous markings on the hamaletron and on the abdomen. So just based on the description, we can easily separate those two uh, species because simulants don't have this kind of markings. But when I examined the specimen, the type specimen of Melanopterus, I was shocked that uh, all the ochreous markings Distant mentioned are just some dirt covered on that specimen. So those two species could be oh. the same species. Yeah, it's quite interesting. So um, this case showed us that even the original description is not always right. So we must uh, examine the type specimens. Uh, here I'm going to show you what I did to help the uh, curator there um, to build the kind of database. Um, I think we should all learn from their good experience. Um, firstly, we have to sort the specimens to make the same species together, and then checking the original description to make sure uh, if the specimen is the type and their type status. And once a specimen was confirmed to be the type specimen, uh, it should be placed in a separate box. And the next step will be labeling. There are five different kinds of labels for the type specimen. First is a box label inserted on the back side of the box and a foam label pinned on the foam. So those two labels uh, could show the original name and the current name of the species, as well as the uh, type status of the specimen. And for the specimen itself, uh, of course, there will be a type label to show if it's a holotype, a paratype, or syntype, and so on. And the sex label to show if it's a male, a female, or a leaf. And this one uh, is a barcode label. Uh, so each specimen in the museum will have its own special barcode label, no matter if it's a type. This barcode will be the guide for us to find the specimen in the database. And after all this work, uh, we have to fill all the uh, write all the information into this, the big table or we see the database. So the first column will be the barcode number. Uh, each specimen in the museum uh, should be recorded. And also for my own study, uh, as well as the database, I have to uh, taking photos for the type specimens as well as their labels. Um, I have to say that to build this kind of database is really a huge task because there's so many specimens in the museum. So visitors from different countries working on different uh, taxa should work together to help the curators to build this kind of database. Uh, it's kind of the protection of the specimens and also could pr provide more convenience to uh, every researcher. And this is the situation in Paris Museum. Um, uh, there are not that many Pyrenees type specimen compared to London, but some specimens are not in very good condition. So uh, they are in urgent need of protection. Uh, after my visit in Paris, I decided to write a type catalog um, with the curators together. So we cataloged the type specimens representing 58 nominal species and five varieties of 16 genera and uh, 48 species and one subspecies are still currently um, here is an example of one species. And you can see that we pro provided the original data uh, copied from the, the original paper and uh, all the information of the types, their uh, uh, type status, all the label information and the type locality, current status and any related remarks of this species. So just in a word, we hope to provide as much as we can for uh, each species and also the um, maybe the images for at least the holotype. And um, the curator in Paris Museum, Dr. Dominic, has added one sentence in the remarks of this species, Rasaha cetosus. And she wrote that only the holotype is preserved in Paris. The paratypes, which were 
preserved in Brazil Museum were probably destroyed during the fire on September 2nd, 2018. So I was very sad to read this sentence at that time. The fire was an accident and we could we ca cannot to predict it. So what we should do now is try our best to um, record and protect the specimens as much as we can and, and as soon as possible. Um, I went to Paris in September 2019, and uh, this catalog was published in 2022. Uh, so it took us about two and a half years to finish all the all the things. Um, uh, so I hope to thank the curators, Dr. Eric and Dr. Dominic, uh, especially Dominic. She told me a lot of things on taxonomy and gives me a lot of in encouragement. Um, I have to say that I have written some papers on, on this subfamily, but um, this catalog seems kind of different. Uh, it makes me feel like finally I could do something for my research taxa. Okay, the third part uh, is about the molecular part. Um, we we know that the molecular data is getting more and more important in taxonomic study, uh, and we all hope to get more uh, data from the specimens, but sometimes we can't get the fresh ones, so we try to extract DNA from the dry specimens, but uh, the contamination and the degradation of dry specimens make it not very easy to success. We could see from the tape stations results that um, the average fragment length of the dry specimen samples will only be 200 BP. Uh, it's very short. Sometimes it's not easy to do the PCR or standard citizen. Uh, I tried this work with the cooperation of uh, Professor Alfred's group in Imperial College London, and we shoot this um, Kaijin micro kit, uh, but we have made some modifications. So um, here are the tips. Uh, all the modifications we made to protect the dry specimens and to get more data because we don't want to uh, destroy the dry specimens. We also need the morphological data. Uh, so uh, the first thing is must to, to operate in the clean bench and we need adequate sterilization work. And before the extraction, we must clean the specimen. So I usually use the 70% arsenal first and then double distilled water uh, and put it uh, dry it on the paper tissue before the, the, the experiment. And I have to see that the body size or with the, the amount of tissue affects a lot. So if possible, uh, we have to put the whole specimen into the tube. Uh, this is also where you don't need to dissect the legs or something like that. And sometimes the specimen will be large. So maybe ch change another uh, larger tube and add more ATL buffer like that. And uh, we have to incubate it overnight, if sometimes more than 12 hours. And also when the specimen is still in the tube, uh, to protect them, we have to change all the centrifuge steps into briefly vortex to reduce the damage. And after the extraction, also we have to clean the specimens. Uh, I also use 17% person ethanol and then dry them on the paper tissue and repaint them back. Uh, I have to mention that the color of some specimens may change after the DNA extraction. So it's better you taking photos for your specimens before the experiment. Uh, and for the sequencing, we tried the single species high throughput sequencing library. And because um, PCR sometimes is not working, so we use the sequences of some related species at the base to identify the corresponding assemblies. Um, the success rate for me for now is only about 65% because sometimes the DNA amount is not enough to build the sequencing library. And sometimes you got the results, but fun is not from your species, but from some bacteria or some fungus or like that. Uh, but I think it still was a try. It's kind of uh, for use of the specimens. And here is a, a application case of extracting DNA from the dry specimens. Uh, when After I examined the species distributed in New Guinea, I found that there are several species. They look quite similar uh, in the structures, but they were assigned to different genera. The first two was uh, the were assigned to the subgenus called uh, CG chorus of Actomachoris. The third was a uh, British Andalus species, and the fourth one might be the new species. So I just wonder, uh, if these four species should all be Actomachoris or Brachy Sandalus, or they should be the separate genus. After the dissecting and the morphological study, I can make sure that they should be the 
be a maybe a monophyletic group, but we I cannot make sure if this should be a subgenus or a separate uh, genus. So we also carried out the mole molecular phylogenetic analysis using uh, 30, 38 Pilani species representing 25 genera. And I have to see that the molecular data of 31 species were all obtained from the dry specimens. And just to be consistent, because we can get uh, the, every species the same uh, sequences. So only three segments were choose. So uh, CO1, 16S, and 18S to build the data set. Um, our exam specimen of one species are all type specimens. And to protect the type, uh, we didn't extract DNA from the type specimen. Only the other three species were included, but they grouped together. And we could see from the tree that they are kind of far from the ectoma chorus or branches and uh, branches. So we could see that uh, it might be a separate genus. So in this paper, the subgenus CD chorus is elevated to the genus level and revised. Uh, four species are recognized and in key, including three new combinations and one new species. So the morphological data could also help us to determine the status of the species. Uh, well, the last part, uh, I would like to introduce a very interesting group. Uh, those three species uh, from the genus uh, uh, Pirates, um, the Pirates Falvisans, uh, Atromaculatus, and Terpes. Uh, they are currently three valid species in taxonomy, but they with, with very similar structures, and uh, they can be distinguished for now by the color pattern of their hematitron. And we could see the details of the, the differences of the hemanitrin. Those three are the type specimen of these three species. And um, we can see that there are four common black spots on all the three species. Uh, first is small oval one on the uh, base of clevis and a small quadrangle on the mm, inner cell, base of inner cell, and a very uh, large oval spot on near the outer cell. And there is a very thin stripe along the seal wing on uh, on the corium. So those four spots are, are the same in the three species. The differences is the orange area. So in terpis, the orange area is a very thin stripe along the apical wings of coriums. And even in some individuals, the this orange part is kind of invisible. So it looks like the whole bug is black. And uh, in Atromaculotus, the orange area is between the C wing and a plus M wings on the corium. So it looks like there is a longitudinal orange stripe uh, in the middle of the wing. And uh, for fluorescence, uh, the orange area is very large, nearly occupy the whole corium and also extending the base of the uh, membrane. So uh, here we call them the, the black one, the strap one, and the orange one just for short of, for representatives. These are the distribution of the three species. Um, and we could see that fluorescence only occur in China. And uh, terpes, uh, the black one, distribute in northeast China. And the striped one, uh, Atromaculatus, uh, has a much broader distribution from northeast Asia to southeast Asia. And their distribution in China is kind of similar with the whole uh, distribution. Uh, and those uh, Three species overlapped in the following five provinces, Liaoning, Hebei, Beijing, Shanxi, and Henan. So we collected some uh, specimens from uh, Xiao Wutai Mountain, Hebei province. Uh, so in this in this mountain, those three species occur together, uh, and we reared them in the lab. Uh, it can be predicted that the, the strap one will mate with the strap one, the orange mate with the orange, the black mate with the black, but we have observed some mixed couples. The orange female with the uh, black male and the orange uh, male with the black female and even the strap one can mate with them um, with different individuals. So they could even make uh, the uh, produce the fertile offsprings. We are having the third generation in our lab uh, and their offsprings are also with three different kinds of color patterns. So we're having some questions, um, how do they mate in the field if if it's the same situation in the lab? And uh, are they the same species because they could mate with each other and produce the fertile offsprings? And are we witnessing the speciation? And if they are the same species, how did the color differences formulate? 
Um, this is a, a they will be a research topic of uh, my colleague, a new student in our lab. And of course, I will take part in this kind of uh, studies. Um, so we know that to figure out this, their relationships must be based on extensive sampling. So here is a kind of advertisement we call for specimens and also cooperation. Uh, if you have specimens of these three species in your collections or any good advice, uh, please contact me. Uh, and we hope to uh, figure out uh, if they are the same species or they are not. Yeah, it's a quite interesting uh, topic. Well, at last, I would like to uh, share one sentence at the ending. Uh, I read this sentence from my social media, and I was very touched at that time. Uh, taxonomy is a pioneering exploration of a strange planet. So I think uh, we are doing the meaningful study, and I hope that we could all keep going. And that's all my talk today. Uh, thank you for listening. A round of applause, please.